Hello. Uh, I am Brittany Aker, um, and we're going to get this road on the show. I want to thank all of you all for joining me uh, for this talk. I hope that we can uh, share some ideas, uh, share some thoughts on how we can infuse ourselves back into the workplace. Um, and I welcome all the conversations, so uh, don't, be, don't be shy. Uh, the talk is called Authenticity is Contagious, Being Real and Showing Emotion Builds Long-Lasting Client Relationships. So in January of this year, me and my husband became new parents to two twin boys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's Xavier on the, is that your left? On your left, and that's Jackson on your right. Uh, and we just hurtled headfirst in all of the newfound parenthood things. Um, we now affectionately call it the beautiful awful. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of parents can relate. My husband went back to work after three days, America. And so I was at home with my mom, a blessing, to do all of the snuggles and the spit ups and the getting food on, all those things, all the sleep deprivation, you know, all the fun stuff uh, for quite a bit while longer. Um, so we also, you know, I had hopes that we had little photo shoots, like they were so cute. They got changed every day, and so they looked like this, and I mean, they were just adorable. So naturally, um, I looked a little more like, like, like this lady, and uh, it was looking like this, uh, probably a bit on the inside as well as the outside, um, and that was the me that went back into the office. And though I was ready, mentally for the challenge that the office brings that you don't quite get at home. Physically, forget about it, right? But it was with that that I started going right back into all the things, all the client interviews. That's part of my, my job at Palantir.net is to uh, do a little worrying and work on our client experience, things like that. Part of that are what I call feedback ses sessions with the clients just to see how we're our engagement's going. So uh, I had one of those, I think the second week back, we had some information we wanted to, 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 to get from clients. We were on a bit of a timeline. So I woke up that day, was that woke up that day, woke up in the middle of that night, um, and I was up and I washed my face and I put on some makeup because for some reason postpartum me was always a little green, I, I don't know. Um, and I got on the call and I was killing it. I was, um, full of life that really didn't exist. I was laughing, I was chuckling, I was making jokes. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that conversation, our client, for the sake of this, I'm gonna call her Susan, not her name. Uh, she was talking and it's like my brain shut off. And suddenly, I don't know if you guys know Charlie Brown, it was, I was just wah, 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 wah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand anything. And uh, she paused probably because she asked me a question or because, I don't know, we were having a conversation and I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. And I had this choice in front of me. Do I pick back up and lean into the mask of professionalism that I've been carrying with me since 14, when did we enter the, work the workforce? Or do I let it go? And I, I don't even know if it was a choice, I let it go. Here's what we're learning. Professionalism is having a negative impact on the way that we're doing work. Let's talk about that a little bit. Traditional professionalism and the effect that it's having on us today. Uh, so this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's the definition of professionalism. Professionalism was uh, kind of invented in North America and Western Europe, shocker, in the 1800s. Um, and it actually didn't sound half bad. Professionalism was characterized as collegial, cooperative, and mutually supportive. Sounds kind of nice. The definition wasn't perfect. It also included things like um, the assumption that competence was guaranteed through education. We all know that that is not, not uh, only not true, uh, but it's quite exclusionary. But you know, inclusive uh, conversations were not happening back then. So the fact of the matter is that the groups of people that this definition was created for, and a lot of us are not a part of that group, but the, for those people, it worked really well for, for quite a while. But then what happened in like the 70s or 80s, so this wasn't even a long time ago, in the 1970s and 80s, the definition of professionalism, that traditional um, suit of armor that we put on in the workplace, it changed. It got, I don't know, a great deal more sinister as a lot of things kind of did in the 70s and 80s. Uh, let's look at the differences between uh, the beginning of those, that, the beginning of that de de definition and then what it became. So 1800 professionalism was, like we said, collegial cooperative and mutually supportive. 
In the 70s and 80s, it largely became a tool of dominance and control. Uh, we saw that in the 1800s, uh, it was constructed within. That meant that the professionals within that group, the devs or the project managers, they created that definition from their own expertise and knowledge. Hugely beneficial, so it was practitioner-led. In the 70s or 80s, businesses took that over, so it was constructed from above by managers, by supervisors, by business heads that didn't have the same expertise as the people that were running it before. Uh, in the 1800s, it was hugely successful because these working groups got to create and define their own working identities. They got to create and define the ways that they worked and interacted with them between themselves and with their clients. In the 70s and 80s, that control was completely taken away. And instead, what we saw was that there were huge limits placed on the discretion of the people that were a part of these working groups, and it really undermined the ethics of the way that they served um, any of the groups that they served. Uh, so I put here bottom line rules all, um, and when bottom line rules all, uh, we know that we get into some, some kinky territory ethics wise, or, or even just the way that we, when we know something is, is better done one way, bottom line may say something else. Uh, and that also resulted in lack of con communication. I do wanna hone in a little bit more about constructed within versus constructed from above. The benefits of, of constructed from within are, are vast. Um, there's more autonomy, there's more trust and enablement in the people that are creating these definitions and doing the work. So this positively impacts not only the workers, but also the clients that we work with. Um, the workers are seen as the experts, uh, the, the way that people escalate later on in life because they don't think the worker themselves is the expert in that, in that thing. That wasn't really happening. There was a, a mutual respect there. When things are constructed by managers and uh, business leaders, in stark contrast, what you see is that it usually rings a bit false. Uh, and it just becomes a means to control the people, the way we work and the bottom line of those projects. So organi organizational objectives, which are usually rooted in money, start to take over all of the good karma, the good juju that we've built with our, with our clients and within our working teams. Um, and you really start to see that those organizational objectives are what start to control the working group or the practitioner client relationship. And um, I'm sure we all know that when those things happen, when you take control from the team, you really start seeing a decline in, in service across the board, um, but also in engagement. So let's talk about some of the unspoken rules of professionalism that we all live by. These, this, this list is tidy, but we're gonna, we're gonna start here. Uh, how about everything is awesome? That is a Lego movie reference. Um, but uh, it, it's essentially everything is awesome all the time. So we are all in the workplace pretending. We, we, are, we are all acting in some kind of communal theater that uh, there's no problems or no, stressor, no stressors that we're all dealing with. No emotion in the workplace, no problems in the workplace no life outside the workplace, no humans in the workplace, right? And these things, uh, they don't even scratch the surface. I mean, these are the things that impact all of us. But how about how it negatively impacts uh, the groups that these things weren't made for, or the, the groups that these rules were made to be excluded by, right? So this doesn't even scratch the surface of at when women enter the workforce or when POC enter the workforce and how things like that um, really impacted, or it still impacts all of us. That leads to some unintended consequences. I like to think they're unintended because I like to think that nobody's in the background, like uh, Mr. Burns from The Simpson, pulling evil strings. Uh, so we'll just go with that. The biggest one for me is a lack of connection. Uh, but then more applicable to us, right, is how about project team burnout? When you can't be yourself, when you can't be honest, uh, you just see teams spiraling. A lack of psychological safety, no space for being human or making errors. You can't speak candidly to your clients, to your bosses, to your team, to anyone that you work with. Um, experiments are risky business, and we are not in the business of, of being risky, uh, right? So there, it, it, it kind of stifles innovation. So in essence, we were intentionally or unintentionally erecting walls between ourselves, our colleagues, and our clients, um, leaving us feeling that disconnection that disconnection weighing on us, um, 
and this is particularly impactful because we spend so much of our lives in the workplace, so much time away from our families and our children and our hobbies, right? All the things we'd rather be doing um, and, and investing in our livelihoods. Uh, the good news is uh, these days we're seeing them, we're seeing them in our rearview mirror. Um, nowadays, attracting our ideal clients and building strong lasting relationships is consisting more and more of open and authentic communication. And we'll talk a little bit later about how layering emotion into that um, can add clarity to those communications. Uh, and the good news is, is that these things are, are more and more attractive to the types of clients that we are looking to attract uh, to our businesses and to our projects. Um, we were already seeing kind of that shedding of the business persona, right? We were seeing that before COVID, but COVID, I mean, it, it blew us light years ahead in a very short time. Suddenly it was impossible to pretend that we were, weren't human with dogs barking in the background, with babies on our laps in meetings, uh, with the world literally falling apart and getting monkeypox, and, and remember, lots of things were happening. Um, but here's the thing, the, the, world, the world fell apart, but it didn't fall apart because we were shedding our professional personas. We had all been taught that if we let those things go, everything would implode, and it absolutely didn't. And collectively, we all realized that Traditional professionalism was a weight that we were no longer willing to carry. Despite everything that we had been told, uh, these things, uh, wearing, I don't know, shorts at the bottom half, because nobody could see it anyway, right? Wearing t-shirts to our meetings. Um, it became very clear that we were all uh, baseline human. We were, we were people, and this brought us together. It was, COVID was a horrible time, is a horrible time. But the way that uh, we saw connectivity in new and, and innovative and interesting ways really changed the game for all of us. And what we found was that the answer to disconnection, the disconnection that we are experiencing and unknowingly perpetuating with this idea of what professionalism should, should look like, um, we found that the answer to that was authenticity. Our clients and our colleagues were looking to be genuinely a part of a team. We were looking uh, for partners and they were looking for partners to uh, partnerships that would share in their values, share in their visions. Uh, we were looking for companies that we could invest in. They were looking for agencies and consultancies that would truly invest and be a part of their successes. Uh, and we were all looking for honesty and transparency and kind of the license and permission to be both in all of these spaces that we worked in. And so here's what I say. I say it's time that we bring ourselves back to our workplace interactions. It's time that we bring more and more of our true selves back into, into the workplace. So what we're gonna talk about is how can authenticity lead to better and deeper client relationships, also with our colleagues? How can we layer in emotion and our emotional response to build trust and rapport into the foundation of these relationships um, with our clients and in our working teams? So authenticity and emotion as tools for change. So uh, in Brene Brown's Daring Greatly, I don't know if we have any Brene Brown fans, she has this, this I like that, fist pump. She has a, a great quote. She's talking about vulnerability. For the sake of this, I'm going to switch out the word to authenticity. But she says, authenticity is not weakness. Uh, it is our willingness to own and engage with our own authenticity, authenticity or emotion that determines the depth of our courage and the clarity of our purpose. Um, so we really need to let go of all of the things that have been ingrained in us about prof traditional professionalism, about being professional, about what that looks like when you show up in professional settings. We need to learn to kind of harness our emotional reactions, we'll talk more about that, for the good of the project. Here's the thing, authenticity begets authenticity. So when we show up as our honest and true selves, we are unwittingly inviting others to do the same. It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, right? We wanna feel safe to be ourselves and to, to show up in that way uh, candidly and awesomely. Uh, and often we feel like we need permission, but it goes both ways. So uh, if we are a little bit brave and we start a little bit small, uh, we can uh, start, uh, kind of start that, that chain reaction, that ripple. Uh, also, our business personas can be closer to our true selves than ever before. Um, I don't think anybody will disagree that at times 
COVID pushed us probably a little too far in the other direction from professionalism. So as we kind of level set and come back to a baseline, the fact of the matter is uh, we can still leave a whole lot more of ourselves and bring a whole lot more of ourselves back to the table um, than we have been able to in the past. Next, we wanna let go of the notion that emotions are for the weak and buy into the idea that emotion can add layers, um, a layer of authenticity to our interactions. Emotional response is key um, when we are talking about better communication. So what does that look like? It looks like leaving the robot at home in the closet, in the attic, to get dusty. It's about being able to not just deliver the words of our messaging, but using our intonation um, and our feelings to add color and to add meaning to the things that we are trying to communicate. Authenticity and emotional response can also deepen our, com our connections because of how we talked about that symbiotic relationship of what we give, we get. Uh, it also has a humanizing effect, and the humanizing effect is imperative because traditional professionalism did everything that it could to take that away. And so we are saying, let's be empowered and start, uh, start taking that back. It also positively impacts psychological safety in our teams, uh, which in turn, it just helps us to be better teams and do better, more innovative work. So again, emotion adds color to the way that we communicate with each other. So we wanna use emotional and emotion and emotional responses as a tool for good. And what this looks like is like, a, it's a strategic revealing of emotion to add a much needed layer to the things that we're trying to say to our client. Emotion can often express our thoughts and our concerns better than simply the words that are coming out of our mouth. Genuine emotion is part of authenticity and authenticity is integral to building that foundation of trust. So I want to give you an example. Uh, we had a client that we had a fantastic relationship with, uh, but over time, there just were some institutional changes on their side that meant that we couldn't work together the, the best way that we, we knew how. And then uh, they got an edict, and the edict was cut our contract by more than a third. That happens, churn happens, change happens with our, our clients. Unfortunately, this was a major site so it's not as if we had just fun things in the backlog, right? We had things that were integral to the stability of their website, um, and we already were struggling to keep up, even though it was a massive project. Strategic, being authentic, and showing that strategic bit of emotion uh, looked like first empathizing with the client. Ugh, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I do not envy that you are the person that has been tasked with this, uh, with, with uh, making this change and we're here to help, right? But letting that emotion into my tone, using those uh, onomatopoeias every once in a while, ugh, you know, authentically, uh, really relays that I'm with you. We are in partnership, we are in community. What we, I, we then followed it up with some curiosity. Uh, do you have the staff to take over the things that we're gonna have to let go? We knew the answer was no, the answer was no. Do you have the skill set on your team to take care of X, Y, and Z? The answer was no. So then I'm, I'm concerned. Now look at the difference between when I can say, well, the, that's concerning because you're gonna fail, or that's concerning because uh, this is difficult, this is difficult work and I don't, I don't know how you're gonna handle it. And I could feel empathetic, I can feel true concern, but that's not what's coming across, right? It feels a bit more lackadaisical, a bit like, well, this is where we're at. So how do we layer in an emotional response to better convey how we're feeling? And the way you do that is with your tone, with your gestures. We can still see each other on Zoom. I know not everybody does cameras, but I often do for that purpose. Um, and we can say, I'm worried. We have some head shakes, we have some shoulder slumps, right? I'm a bit worried about the direction that you all are going. But we're here to support you in your work. We're gonna take it back to the team and see what we can do. And what we did is we gave them two options. We gave them one that got them to their goal, and we said not suggested, big, fat, bold letters. But if this is the direction you choose, we will support you, we will do our best. We gave them one that got them about halfway there. It wasn't ideal, because ideally we would have increased the contract, right? Uh, but then we said this is our suggested proposal, so you know these are the things that you will lose in the transition. But again, we are here. We're your partner, we're here to help. 
They ended up going with the lesser of the two evils. We eventually ended up sunsetting the, uh, that project anyway, but we were able to leave with a, an, a fantastic client relationship. We will absolutely revisit work together again in the future if it, if it makes sense. And that's always the goal. Projects end, true and genuine connection does not. So the consequences or benefits of showing up like never before. We are able to build trust and honesty into the foundation of uh, these working relationships. Clients and colleagues do not have to guess at our intentions. When we show up authentically and honestly, uh, there is that assumption of positive intent, right? If I have to say, hey, that's not great, there is no, mm, does she mean that? Is she only trying to get money? Is she only trying to, we've said it from the beginning. Uh, the standard of we are going to show up to authentically support each other in this work that we do. I am engaged. I am empowered. I am excited to support the success of, of, of the work that we do together. Uh, also a small tidbit uh, that, that talks about how we, we want to be as much a part of a client team as possible. Project teams that, this is what I've seen, a theme of project teams that, retro, that are able to retro authentically with a client. Uh, see greater success. Uh, we have much better client engagement. We have much better project outcomes. But all of that is built on this idea that we authentically show up to that space and we have the psychological safety to, to be candid. So why does the ability to be authentic um, in the workplace, what, is, what does that mean to you? Um, I would like a little audience participation. I'll start. And I'm going to start with something, it's not silly, but it's maybe smaller. Um, I started wearing my hair curly to work for the first time maybe five years ago. <laughs> I think um, people might, uh, I don't know if everybody understands that that's a big deal. We now have this thing called the Crown Act. And the first time in our nation, um, women are, are people of, and women of, uh, people of color are being protected by being able to wear the hair that comes out of our head to the workplace and not be discriminated for it. It's major. Um, I was taught from a very young age that curly hair is unprofessional. So I have my entire life straightened my hair. If I went to an interview, I straightened my hair. And if you talk to, and this is not exclusive to um, just black women, but if you talk to a lot of women who have curly hair or other textured hair, you'll find that that's the case. So that for me is hugely empowering. This job at Pounder.net was the first uh, interview I ever went to with curly hair. Uh, and clearly I haven't, I haven't turned back. Would anybody else like to share what it feels like to them uh, to show up authentically in the workplace? Beautifully modified. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to paraphrase for the recording. So she's saying that she's heavily modified, and I said beautifully modified, and that means that she can't show up as anything other than herself. But like we're saying, that also gives our clients the permission and the license to do the same. Excellent. Jenna? I love that. I love the example that Jenna gave of um, being a Disney adult. You don't always know where those connections are going to happen. Um, sometimes it happens in parenthood because so many of us are parents. Um, sometimes it happens with uh, being Disney-loving adults. I'm also a Disney-loving adult. 
um, you never know. And unless we are showing up with um, authenticity and curiosity, we're never gonna we're never gonna find out. Anybody else? I think it's somebody over here. Let me get somebody in the back. Go ahead. Mm, plus plus. I love that snaps of that. I think being open and authentic um, and honest about mental health issues is kind of one of our last frontiers, right? We're busy tackling. Um, different racial, ethnic issues, we're busy tackling LGBTQIA, and I think that um, some of our disabled friends have been left behind, so I applaud that, thank you. Anybody else? Hi. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, what's so amazing about that is that our, we all just wanna be great team members. We, for the most part, genuinely care about each other and each other's well beings, but we need the opportunity to do it, right? So if I'm on your team and I have no idea what you're going through, I would think to myself, well, Tracy's sucking recently, <laughs> right? Mm. I don't know what's going on there. But by giving me, and it doesn't mean that we have to impart all of our business. We're, you know, we don't have to, to provide the, the tea for, for everybody to, to, to mull over. But just by saying, hey, I can't show up the way that I, I really want to right now, it allows everybody to step up in ways. And it builds such stronger connections amongst us. Um, and that so carries forward. I'm going to move on, but I'd love to hear more stories later, OK? Um, so where am I? There we go. So this practice helps us uh, attract and keep our ideal clients. So uh, how is that the case? I do, as we get into this kind of section, want to acknowledge that there's a lot of privilege in this practice. Tech has a lot of privilege in this way to start out with. Um, we are all very much allowed to show up with different colored hair and, and sweatpants and, and all the things. Not everybody has that kind of safety, but uh, we can also talk about some smaller ways that we can go against the status, the status quo. Uh, so not everyone is safe to be themselves. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are talking about uh, revealing of emotion, um, use of emotion as a layering communicative tool. We are not talking about leading with emotion. When I say leading with emotion, I don't know about you, but I immediately can think of several times where I've just even just been in the room and a part of uh, some kind of communication or witnessed it that was awful, and I, that's not what we're talking about. Leading with emotion can often be dangerous, um, often it's about losing control in that moment. That's not what we're talking about. We still very much want to be in control of ourselves and, and our, our, our persons in the, the workplace to the best of our ability. We're human, um, right? But the other thing is this is not, I mean, um, I cannot talk today. This is authenticity, right? Um, we, this is not a, a manipulation tactic. I am not looking, our clients are not looking for the fabrication of caring. They're not looking for us to create uh, emotions or things that, that, that aren't really there. This is really about, if this is really about attracting our ideal client, then we are looking for genuine um, interactions. Uh, so this is about building genuine connections and creating a foundation of trust and sincerity. I also wanna add that this is an additive practice. So if we, are, we go about trying to implement some of these things in our day-to-day -day working life, and it is taking away from our message and our work, then we're not doing it right. Uh, for instance, the difference between showing a little frustration in a call to, to get our point across um, is one thing. Bursting into tears is another. Uh, could we burst into tears sometimes? Yes. Sometimes we get off Zoom and go cry a little bit, maybe, maybe. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. We want to add to um, the foundation of these, these relationships. We're not looking to detract from, from the great things that we're doing together. 
So we just need to learn to kind of lean in strategically to those emotional reactions in ways that are business appropriate. And then remember again, it's just the chicken and the egg. Somebody's gotta go first. So this is a quote from Margaret Heffern Heffernan, who's also really awesome. Um, this is from her Forget the Pecking Order at work. Uh, is it a TED Talk? It's on YouTube. Um, she's a really awesome speaker. And she says, what motivates people are the bonds and loyalty and trust they develop between each other. What matters um, is the mortar, not just the bricks. In my mind, the bricks are the things that we're all going to do anyway. Our deliverables are going to be excellent. We're going to hit those KPIs. Um, our clients are going to be heard. Uh, we're going to set goals together that we're going to knock out of the park. But the mortar are all those soft skills that we sometimes forget about, and authenticity and emotion are absolutely those things. We can do all the things, all the great projects, deliver a fantastic website, but if we are horrible to work with, if there is just no connection on that project team, when that project is over, the client's gone. And for the most part, they're not really looking to see us again. When they go out for more work, they're gonna go out for more work. They're not gonna call us up and say, hey, we're doing this cool thing and we want you back. Um, our clients may be attracted to us for various reasons. Uh, I have <laughs> street cred on here. Uh, whatever our proposed uh, approaches, our pricing, things like that. But those, the, the mortar that holds us together, that holds those engagements together, are the reasons they keep coming back or that they'd never leave. Because we've all, uh, hopefully, we've all had those clients. That they get in the door and they just, they love us and they, they never want to go. So these connections help us begin to build um, with our clients and it, it can often tip the scales in our favor. So connection won't always win us everything, especially if we don't have as much experience or maybe we're missing the mark, um, but it will keep us top of mind when they have other, other opportunities. Um, I had the opportunity to submit a proposal for an end-to-end -end web redesign for a university in uh, the Midwest. Um, it was one of the best, most connected, um, just examples of a sales process that I'd ever, I'd ever dealt with. Um, I still see her at DrupalCon. I'm looking at her. She might be here, I can't see that well. Um, we still run into each other. They ended up going with somebody, it wasn't her choice, but we still like rejoice when we see each other. It's one of those things that, and you never know when those things come back, right? Um, you put that out in the world and it can be this job, it can be the next job, it can be the one after that. Um, but th that's the type of connectedness that we're talking about. So a foundation of authenticity benefits everyone. So when we show the world who we truly are, uh, we become more attractive to, to those who are like us and are looking for the things that we have to offer. Clients don't know what they know, and they know it. It's a huge position of vulnerability on their part, especially because often these things come with massive price tags. So um, acknowledge that and provide somewhere soft for them to land. And a lot of these uh, engagements will go a lot more smoother. Uh, our showing up gives license, just like our friend here said, gives license to our colleagues, our clients, and everyone around us to, to do the same. Um, our ability to work as true partners with our clients is really predicated on being able to meet on common ground and common ground only happens when we are navigating those relationships with authenticity. Um, think about, before I move on, think about how um, we have clients that are not navigating our spaces with authenticity and how that negatively impacts our teams. Think about clients that are maybe abusive, borderline abusive, maybe um, they're dealing with pressures of their own that just kinda, we were having this conversation just the other night that just kinda gets passed along our way. These are not great projects. And though we will deliver our bricks, our mortar is non-existent. And so the strength of the foundation of that relationship will continue to be shaky until we're able to, to bring those things together. So can you think of an example where um, you could have used this technique to, to better communicate? We're gonna do take that as a thought exercise because I'm moving a little slower than I'm supposed to. Um, but think of different examples of, of, oh, I could have layered this in that way, or, you know, I didn't communicate this as well as I could. Um, a good example could be, I heard them and I knew that was gonna be bad later on in the project. And I said, okay, and they never knew. How could I, if I go back in time, how could I have been authentic in that conversation? How could I have layered in some, you know, some nodding, some shaking of the head, 
some, some up down shoulders? How could I have conveyed with a, a layer of emotion that um, this wasn't gonna work well in a way that would give them pause? In the conversation that I had with Susan at the beginning of uh, my return from maternity leave, uh, when I dropped the mask, uh, what that really led to was three to five minutes of genuine connection. It wasn't long, uh, but we talked about sleep deprivation, my newfound sugar addiction. Uh, we talked about um, the beautiful awful that is parenthood. But what happened was really magical because when we came back to the conversation about feedback, there was, um, it's almost like there was, we relaxed, right? And now, instead of an interview, it was a conversation, which is always the goal. And we were able to candidly talk about the ways that we were kicking butt for them, but also about the ways that we could improve. And that is so important to, to the customer experience and to retention. So how can we be the change? Make honesty your policy and stop selling pipe dreams. Authenticity starts in your sales cycle. Um, we've got to stop selling things that don't exist or we know our project teams can't do, won't do, don't want to do, and then throwing it over to these poor uh, POs <laughs> and then backing away slowly, right? Uh, it just results in disappointment for everyone involved. Uh, we want to set goals and expectations early and often. When things change, and they will, we want to reset them again. And we want to be honest about the why. We want to communicate often with clients. Clients should never be surprised about things that come up if we can help it, and often we can help it. There are times where we're going to be surprised, so then they will too, but often we can see things coming. Uh, we are awesome at our jobs, right? We can oft often see the, the calamity, um, so communicate that. And then charter together, this is a good one, and charter authentically, make agreements about how we wanna work together, how we wanna navigate our conversations and our relationship, and then stick to it. Um, we also wanna be able to model the behavior that we wanna see. Remember, chicken and the egg, somebody's gotta go first. Let's be those people that uh, enter our rooms authentically um, and with integrity, and uh, that will encourage everyone else in the room to do the same. And then, this is another one from a place of privilege, but don't work with people you don't respect. And often, uh, we know that from the sales cycle. If we are in a position to turn down work, then turn down work. Know that our ideal clients are out there. We are looking for them, they are looking for us. And if we can hold firm, if we have the privilege of doing so, we'll find each other. How am I doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. All right, so we're gonna do an activity together. Um, I, I think we're pretty even. So we're gonna kinda chat together. In my head, I thought we are gonna be at the round tables. It's okay, we can turn around and make some friends. But we're gonna chat together, and I want this side of the room, you're gonna be scenario one. So your client has given you information that may have a negative impact on your project. And we're gonna talk about how we can respond authentically in that conversation, and how we can layer in um, emotion to better communicate um, what we're trying to communicate. And then on my right here, we're gonna talk about you have to tell your client that our team is gonna miss a deadline. Not fun, gave you guys the hard one. Um, how can we do the same, okay? I'm gonna set a timer and we'll see how we do. Oh, and to make your life easier, maybe nominate a spokesperson that can share some of our aha moments. Yeah?
Okay. I just looked at the time. <laughs> it's in my head, it, we ha I started at two. I did not, so we're, we're running a little out of time. So hopefully we have some, uh, some things we can share. Saw lots of great uh, engagement going on. So we have some spokespeople that wanna, I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot. Does anybody wanna share any of our aha moments? <laughs> Go Jenna. Absolutely. So the, the, the star standouts for me were validation, empathy, active listening before solutioning. I think that's great. Thank you, Jenna. Anybody else? Hey, Fred. I love that, more intimate meetings. That's key. How do you build connection with 30 people at the same time? <laughs> you can't, right? But we do our best to, to whittle that down. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else? Awesome, oh, hey Travis. That's perfect, it's a, and it's a perfect way to approach it. I've seen great success with sending a leading email. Hey, let's chat. This is what we're gonna chat about. So you're kind of saying, get your mind right, because we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have it out together, but we're in this together. So we're gonna talk about it. It's gonna be rough, but we're partners, and we're gonna figure it out. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Hi. Love it. Ownership, not blame. Yep. Y'all are experts. I don't know why I'm up here. <laughs> you could be up here with me. That's fantastic. So uh, the last thing I'm going to end with is what's next, and it's practice, practice, practice. Let's look for safe ways, safe um, spaces and situations to try these techniques. Uh, let's start small. Uh, one of the liberating structures that I really lean into is 15%. So what can I do in this interaction or in this situation to make it 15% better? Um, and then uh, just chicken and egg it. Remember, be brave, and uh, we'll all do great. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I would love to answer some questions. We're a bit out of time. I have a couple minutes, so we can uh, talk here, but then also I'd love to welcome you back to our booth, palantir.net. We're right across from the Drupal organization booth, and it's super cute. Come sit and chat and get some swag and join us. So, thanks, guys. <laughs>often don't think it's about the authenticity itself it's sometimes finding common common ground isn't always common so sometimes you uh, may try to I didn't realize how much people love babies uh, and I didn't realize how much people love twins 
Yeah. My goodness. It's been like, I've been riding that wave since I came back from early leave. But I did try it with one client, and they weren't mean or anything, but it was clearly not the path to success. So I had to pivot a little bit, ended up being matcha tea. So you know, sometimes you just have to, you have to, you have to work around it. And then also, you know what, sometimes people are awful. <laughs> it is what it is, right? And we like to think that everyone has something redeeming, but we're not always gonna find it on a Zoom call. So uh, sometimes we just, we just gotta do our best. Anybody else? Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then there's so many different reactions. So she said um, that it's some people aren't authentic, or maybe they haven't been safe to be. And people have different reactions to that. Sometimes when people see you being free in a way that they are not free, uh, they may attack that thing. It becomes it becomes a threat, right? And it, it triggers like their flight their fight or flight response. And then sometimes they embrace it, and for the first time, then they feel that freedom and they embody it through you. That's the one we're really hoping for. Um, but you don't know that till you try. And if they're the first one, then maybe they're not your ideal person, and that's okay because there's someone out there for them too. It's not like it's not like it's a love connection, but you know what I'm saying. Are we good? All right, thank y'all. Visit us, visit us at the booth. Oh, and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to continue our conversation. <laughs>